just leave them walk out. I'm gonna first of all call up the three panelists, three women, uh, Lorna McGregor, who is a professor of law at the University of Essex, was mentioned before. Uh, she is the director of the Human Rights Center there, and she also is uh, the leading uh, investigator, principal investigator of a big project about technology, big data, and uh, human rights. Uh, Lorna, welcome. Then we have Flynn Coleman, who comes from New York. She teaches at New York University. She's a human rights attorney, a social entrepreneur. Welcome. And Solange Granauti, who teaches cybersecurity at the University of uh, Lausanne. Welcome. And I guess we need to give you one of these mics. So you have two of them. Solange, yours is there on the table. Uh, so, I thought that, first of all, I assume that we, you, you all think that this documentary is accurate, right? You haven't spotted any weakness in the documentary, <laughs> correct? Okay. So, I thought that the first thing to do is maybe to establish a sort of baseline, uh, because we all here have read now for several years uh, and heard about artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, can uh, Flynn, maybe can you just give a, a definition of what AI really is so that everybody is on the same page? Absolutely. So AI, artificial intelligence, I think it's important to remember that of course we need to use language to communicate so that we can have a common understanding, but this is still something that's very much up for debate. So one definition of artificial intelligence or AI is that it's robotics, software, and computers with the capacity for intelligent behavior. Um, though some people prefer to use the word synthetic intelligence, others prefer augmented intelligence. So there's a lot of questions that remain, but it is somewhat of a buzzword. So I think while we need to figure out some terminology, it's important to recognize that these come labeled with things that might connote a certain feeling. One of the words most used in the movie was data. And of course, data is a key element of this, right? No data, no AI, lots of data, better AI. I think that, of course, they are related but not the same. And one helpful thing that's helped me understand is that, so big data and AI are different, but AI is what has helped unleash the power of big data because the data is a heap of data until you have something to analyze it. So that's one way to think about the connection. Uh, Lorna, what you've seen in the movie is a rather basic version of AI. It's essentially pattern recognition. I have a lot of data and the system goes through and figures out patterns and then defines the boxes in the neighborhoods and all these kind of things. Uh, we can say that that's just the beginning. It's really a basic, basic kind, of, kind of type. Um, yes, but I think that it's um, a very powerful type um, and the one that we're you know, very preoccupied with. It raises with all the questions already, the absolutely. Yeah. And I think the definition um, that Flynn's giving is a really important one to work with. And all I would add to that is the flip of what AI does to big data is that big data fuels um, AI. It, it, that's often the way in which it's used. So we're thinking about what might happen in the future as this big data continues to fuel the AI. So uh, in the at the beginning of the movie, there was a reference to Minority Report, and I assume that a lot of people here remember or have seen that uh, uh, movie with Tom, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, where uh, you know, crimes are basically predicted before they would happen, and people will be arrested for the assumed intention that they were about to commit a, a crime. Now, one thing that strikes me is that, uh, and, and, and the documentary says, Hollywood has, reality has caught up with Hollywood. One thing that strikes me is that the Tom Cruise movie was set in 2054. Uh, so this technology is really going faster than Hollywood. Flynn. I think that yes, generally yes. So um, I think to be in the, in the business of prediction can be a dangerous one and it's important to think about it, but I think there's a lot of focus on that. So we don't exactly know what's coming and when it's coming, but we know something's coming. What we do know is that information technology and technology in general along the trajectory of human history has kind of grown with a very steep trajectory recently. 
post-industrial revolution. So we know it's coming fast. Some people like Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist, thinks that um, the singularity is coming very, very soon, um, in less than 30 years actually, and some people think it's gonna take a lot longer. So what we do know for sure is that we, it's kind of an exponential growth of technology. We just don't know exactly when and how. Um, and a lot of people are certainly in the business of predicting that, and it definitely is coming on very fast. I think I would just say one more thing that would be interesting for all of us here, which is there is something called the AI effect, which is that we already have AI. It's already here in Netflix, it's already here in Google, but there is something about AI, and I have some theories, I'm sure all of us do, as to why this happens. When we um, create or invent an AI, suddenly we decide it's not an AI anymore, and we're not quite there yet. What you're saying is that we're kind of you know, looking at the actual real embodiment of something like her in the movie Her, uh, and, and, and that's the real thing, and, and what we have is just uh, normal, normal stuff. Uh, Solange, en effet, on, on, est, on est totalement entouré de systèmes qui sont déjà euh, catégorisables comme de l'intelligence artificielle. Euh, elle en a cité un ou deux, mais il y a Siri, Alexa, les voitures intelligentes ou, ou les voitures qui se conduisent toutes seules, les drones, euh, etc. Ça fait déjà partie de notre vie, en fait. Euh, oui, effectivement, nous avons contribué à bâtir euh, tout cet écosystème numérique en utilisant euh, les applications qui nous sont données et puis en étant connectés en permanence. Et on voit aussi, à partir de, de ce qu'on a pu euh, voir dans le film, que cette collecte d'informations va permettre d'automatiser des raisonnements et de faire des inférences. Et le lien entre peut-être euh, ces données collectées et les systèmes euh, prédictifs, c'est la, la capacité qu'ont ces systèmes euh, de faire des statistiques, de faire des inférences. Et le problème, là, c'est les mauvaises inférences, les mauvaises corrélations et les mauvaises déductions. Et effectivement, ça enferme des, des, des personnes dans des profils prédéterminés dont il sera absolument difficile de sortir. Et le problème de base, c'est cette collusion, je pense, entre les intérêts commerciaux et les intérêts de la souveraineté des pays, de, notamment d'assurer les actions de justice et police, et de peut-être mettre trop de confiance dans ces algorithmes qui vont sur des critères complètement obscurs, et c'est très bien montré dans, dans le film, déterminer qui pourrait être le criminel ou pas. Et cette manipulation d'opinion, que ce soit des dirigeants politiques, économiques ou des dirigeants des forces de police, mais est vraiment préjudiciable pré, 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 euh, voilà, euh, à, à notre libre arbitre et à notre conditionnement. Et on va être conditionné à se comporter comme les algorithmes nous, nous disent de, de faire. Quoi. On va toucher à ça dans une seconde, mais je pense que vous enseignez à l'Université de Lausanne, vous êtes un spécialiste de cybersécurité. Je pense que tout le monde ici se pose la question, est-ce que les technologies comme, comme Anschlab ou comme... Euh, euh, près de Paul sont utilisés par les polices suisses ou ah, seront utilisés par alors, les polices suisses je vais répondre en, en deux temps pour revenir un peu à la question précédente sur ces objets connectés et je crois que plus on sera connecté plus on utilisera ces objets à des fins y compris ludiques parce que c'est comme ça que ça marche c'est qu'on est, qu est attiré par le, le, la facilité que ça puisse avoir et le côté un peu ludique de ces technologies qui nous sont vendues avec un marketing vraiment très 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 bien fait qui ne nous permet pas de nous en sortir alors évidemment si c'est utilisé dans les polices américaines il y a quelques années déjà en arrière on peut très bien penser qu'elles soient aussi utilisées en Suisse ou en Europe. Donc c'est vrai que ce marché du logiciel prédictif est un marché et il y a donc des acheteurs. Est-ce qu'il y a des discussions au niveau des spécialistes par rapport à, à, au niveau de transparence que ces choses-là devraient avoir ou est-ce qu'on devrait simplement avoir une obligation pour la police de déclarer qu'ils utilisent ce type de technologie, par exemple Mais Moi, je pense que nous sommes tous très passifs par rapport à tout ça et on n'a pas du tout conscience de la vie cachée des données que nous avons. Et euh, est, il est vrai que dans plein de services automatisés, on ne sait pas si c'est l'algorithme qui prend la décision ou nous-mêmes. Il y a des initiatives effectivement, parlementaires, notamment en France, qui demandent la transparence des algorithmes et puis la vérification de la décision prise par des algorithmes. Donc, c'est des courants de pensée qui, qui émergent. Comme on a vu en Europe aussi, ce courant fort pour la protection des données numériques. Donc il y a des initiatives juridiques qui, qui permettent d'avancer un tout petit peu ou de faire réfléchir sur ces questions. Mais... Flynn, uh, this technology brings up a lot of different points of view. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an optimistic view that says this is going to help us solve cancer and uh, social problems of uh, uh, incredible scale, things that we have never been able to solve so far. And there is a pessimistic view, which is you know, the, the Terminator version, or uh, Stephen Hawking, who died uh, earlier this, this week, saying that AI may mean the end of the human race. I know you side on the optimist side of the line, so why? Why optimist? Well, I think that there's many answers to that question. The first is that we can't afford not to be. Um, I think it was Helen Keller who said, you know, no pessimist discovered the secret of the stars 
or sailed to an uncharted land or opened up a new doorway to the human spirit. So I think that there's a lot of talk, again, of this very binary, it's going to save us all or it's going to kill us all, Terminator style type thinking. And both of those are scenarios that could happen. I think that the more realistic one is that it's these insidious kind of in-between gray areas that are either going to increase inequality in a major way or help us close that gap and increase access. So I'm optimistic because, you know, as people that focus on human rights, as a human rights lawyer, I've seen the worst in humanity as working in genocide and war crimes. I've also seen the best of humanity in our resilience and in our courage. So I'm an optimist because even if we fail, and individually we all will to some extent, we can strive and we can push a little bit further and maybe we can help one person. So it's not really avoiding you know, the inevitable failure, or the inevitable end that all of us face, but it's that striving anyway. Okay. Then I'm going to ask Solange uh, about uh, her <laughs> version of that. I'm quite sure that she's actually a bit on the other side. But first, give us a couple of examples of AI for good. Yeah, so because that, real examples. Of course. So it's, again, it's a great question. Technology is a tool. can be used you know, for good or for bad. Um, AI for good, some concrete examples um, already are happening in the medical field, for example. So we talked about big data. Um, and you know, detecting things like cancer is something that usually would require a human to go through many, many journals, many, many sets of um, data. And it's not really possible um, for humans to do. So for example, um, there's been some collaborations with labs and radiology to be able to sort through all these journals, all of the scans, so that we can more quickly come to a determination to be able to save a patient's life. Um, there's also this idea of inclusion, so people with certain types of impairments. One of my best friends in the world is a disability rights activist, and she's always talking about this idea of universal inclusion, this inclusion revolution. So can we find tools for people that have a visual impairment, for example? These are people that could you know, be helped if we have things like self-driving cars. We have things that are enabling people, not to change, but to make the world more inclusive. So these are some of the examples. There's drones, for example, that are being used um, in Rwanda now to deliver blood to remote parts of the country. So the technology exists and someone's going to use it. So we need to make sure that you know, we're all in that fight. Solange, est-ce que vous partagez l'optimisme de Flynn euh, euh, Oui et non. En fait, euh, ce n'est pas du bon ou du mauvais usage qu'on ferait de la technologie sur laquelle il faudrait s'intéresser de son point de vue, mais c'est la façon dont ça nous transforme dans nos comportements, dans notre façon d'être humain et d'être au monde, d'être aux autres. Et je pense que cette dimension de transformation et de conditionnement, et là on le voit un peu dans le film, les technologies qui nous conditionnent d'une façon euh, pervasif et puis pervers, je dirais, euh, est, est vraiment un problème. Et de la même façon qu'il peut y avoir des, des erreurs dans la conception des, des logiciels pour la police prédictive, mais pour la santé, c'est la même chose. Le, le problème, c'est qu'on n'a pas encore les moyens de contrôler euh, le code quand il est programmé. C'est aussi évoqué dans le film, c'est que l'ingénieur n'a pas la vision globale de ce qu'il fait, et c'est des approches de saucissonnage du travail pour justement euh, celui qui appuie sur le bouton de la chambre à gaz ne, ne sait pas ce qu'il fait. C'est à peu près ça, je veux dire. Donc on a, une, on a du mal à intégrer, à avoir cette vision complète. Et surtout, on ne sait pas comment contrôler le col quand il est produit, et on ne sait pas le contrôler quand il est processé par le processeur. Et on a vu récemment quand même des failles dans le processeur, dans la majorité des processeurs, la prise de contrôle à distance de ces processeurs, hein, et ça pose aussi des problèmes de sécurité, parce qu'on voit bien euh, le contrôle, la qualité, le, le produit, et celui qui va contrôler d'une façon licite ou illicite toute cette chaîne de production et tout le cycle de vie euh, de ces algorithmes et de l'usage des données, bah, va être le roi du monde. Il peut y avoir des usages abusés, abusifs, des tourner et de criminels terroristes. Okay, et ça, yeah. on ne sait pas le prévenir, ça. Il y a une façon de regarder l'intelligence artificielle comme de quelque chose qui a peut-être des défauts, mais qui est au moins cohérent, comme on imagine euh, la, la, le cerveau d'un humain. Euh, on a des défauts, des, des défauts de faiblesse, etc., mais il y a une certaine cohérence dans le fonctionnement. Donc, c'est quelque part, euh, euh, on peut prévoir le, un certain type de, de, de comportement. Ouais. Euh, là, vous êtes en train de dire, en fait, qu'en réalité, ce qu'on est en train de faire, c'est de construire un système qui est de plus en plus complexe, de moins en moins transparent, euh, oui. de moins en moins contrôlable, oui. donc avec beaucoup de failles. Absolument. Et puis, il va être complexe, plus on va inventer une autre technologie pour le contrôler, et on aura plus tendance à faire confiance à la nouvelle technologie. Euh, pour contrôler l'humain. Voilà, exactement. Et on est quand même dans cette fuite en avant de la technologie qui, euh, euh, qui paraît sans limite et qui pose certainement des, des problèmes. Maintenant, là, dans le film, on a vu euh, l'utilisation de technologies spécialement pour euh, euh, faire de, de la police prédictive. Euh, mais entre là et euh, contrôler euh, les désaccords sociaux ou, ou les dissensions, euh, réduire la, la liberté d'expression ou carrément faciliter la répression, il n'y a, a que quelques petits pas. 
Oui, et puis peut-être aussi, vous l'avez évoqué en parlant de l'ADN, on se rend bien compte que le corps humain et que tout le vivant est un système d'information. Et nous sommes peut-être les systèmes d'information avant même que le terme ou la technologie ait été inventée. Et là, on est dans un contexte où on est capable de, de capter l'information que nous sommes du vivant, mais on est dans l'industrialisation du vivant. Et on considère ces données comme des données commerciales. Et je pense que c'est la dimension commerciale de tout ça qui pose problème, de l'enjeu éthique de l'ultralibéralisme et du, du traitement informatique sans limite. Et de considérer l'humain comme un système, comme un objet qui peut être amélioré pour entrer dans des cases particulières prédéterminées par des algorithmes. Lorna, um One thing seems clear to me, and it is that the advances of uh, AI, if you want to safeguard our humanity in the face of AI, need to somehow be built around human rights, essentially. How we need to infuse some principles of right and wrong and, and, uh, and values to, uh, to, uh, into, into uh, machines. So human rights as a core design principle for AI? Um, I, I think so. I think it's really important that we think about how our existing international human rights framework um, applies to this space. We're in Geneva, um, the heart of the UN human rights system, and I think that it's really important that we think about what we have already achieved and how it will apply in this space. And I think the important thing when we think about opportunities and risks um, is that AI is here, technology is here, big data is here. It's a reality, and it is going at a really fast pace. Um, and we have to think in the human rights world um, about how we can benefit um, from this reality, um, whether we think it's right or wrong, it's happening. So how can it advance human rights, as Flynn's talking about? But even when we're thinking about how it can advance human rights, we have to think about how to ensure that there are not human rights risks at the same time. Um, so we don't want to get into the situation where we say um, big data, AI, can help us better document human rights violations, or it can help us respond to disaster or humanitarian crisis better. But in doing so, there are certain rights that will be violated. So we always have to make sure that the human rights Um, framework underpins opportunities as well as risks. Um, but I think this film really highlights the big risks that we need to urgently respond to. Um, the criminal justice system is a really sharp end example of how predictive technology um, can present huge risks. So when we see something about pre-crime before someone has even committed a crime, um, that really turns on its head the idea of innocent until proven guilty because someone hasn't even done anything yet and yet they have a criminal justice intervention. Um, we see the real risk of discrimination in this film and the targeting of communities that are already over-policed in many instances um, and how these technologies can feed into existing practices in real life and may Um, give consequence and result to issues on the right to liberty. Um, so I think this film is, you know, a one good example among another, uh, f a number of other examples in the criminal justice system, in immigration systems, where we have to be really concerned about the use of technology in AI. And so I think we need to be not just thinking about how do we manage what's already happening and what may come, mm. but we need to really fundamentally think about what is the society we want to live in and what is the place of technology, what is the place of AI, and what are we prepared to let develop and where are the red lines where we say, sorry, this is not a space where we're prepared to let this enter. The discussion doesn't seem to be happening almost anywhere at a social level. It's happening among specialists and experts. It's happening in some small quarters. But uh, uh, I have the impression that everybody here assumes that there is no slowdown of the technology possible. And uh, my assumption is the reason, because especially of the competition between the two big actors of this technology, which are Silicon Valley, run by corporations, and China, run by the government. And each one wants to get there first, wants to get there so, so AI as a super intelligence first. Uh, so there is no way of kind of slowing down and trying to figure out first the moral and ethical implications, et cetera, et cetera. Am I thinking right, or? Well, I think, um There's often an interest in saying it's anti-innovation to talk about regulation, to talk about ethics, to talk about human rights. 
Um, but I think we have to. I think um, we absolutely have to set the, the framework now um, before it's too late. I think there is a nice line in the movie, if I can find it, where someone, um, I forgot who, said, before dystopian reality, um, when things can be done about it. Yeah. And I think that's the moment we're in now, where we have to think about this is the reality, how can we benefit it from it while dealing with the risks? And where are these red lines where we just say, this is not where, as a society, we're prepared to go? Flynn, uh, you're writing a book about this very issue, how to inject values into machines, right? Now, values are something that are difficult to define and describe. They're even more difficult to agree upon, and certainly they're very difficult to put into software. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, um, I think that, you know, ultimately, as we'll see in this field, is that there's so many more questions than answers. So let's say we all even agree that we should infuse ethics and values into machines. Okay, great, which ones do we choose? Isaiah Berlin talks about this concept of values pluralism. So is it even possible to choose and how to kind of make a hierarchy of these values? So, of course, there are no easy answers to those questions. And in fact, we debate these questions in human rights all the time. And we're debating them across, you know, um, cultures, across spaces, you know, equality versus freedom in the U.S. I mean, there are so many different ways that we could come to a dead end. I think that the only thing that I've understood for sure is that we need to be asking these questions and there need to be more people at the table of diverse viewpoints, demographics, and ideas so that we can be having this debate. The most dangerous thing happening in this field right now is we're making it, we don't know quite sure how it works, but trust us, we're really trying to help the world here. And that's where this idea of regulation and of course all the dangers come into play. So we need to be having these discussions and we need to be understanding that we're moving towards an idea of input these systems into a place. So for example, one of the greatest lines I thought in the film was this idea of code not having a conscience. And part of the reason this is so challenging is because well, what, what does intelligence mean? What does consciousness even mean? So part of why this is holding up a mirror to us so much is because our very space in the food chain is being threatened. And if we can't figure these ideas out for ourselves, how do we end wars in general? How do we figure out you know, which values to use? Of course, it's gonna be difficult, but it's in that journey, in that willingness to come together at the table and to pull out a chair for someone else of a different demographic that we can get more examples. I'll just give one really quick example to make it concrete. So I was on a panel about diversifying the future of emerging technology and AI. And um, for example, you know you're, when you put your hand under the faucet for the water to come down, right, in, the, in, in a bathroom? That is cued to light skin. So if someone of color is not involved in the discussion, the faucet is not going to work. So we can't solve our problems, but we can say we need to have diverse viewpoints, men, women, people of color, people from different places to come together. Because that is an answer that's intractable. I, for example, just me, this is my life's work, I wouldn't be able to solve that. It's only by opening the doors and giving access and agency to people that they can help us make these choices. Same with human rights. We don't save anybody, but we can give people opportunity and agency and access to help themselves. Uh, Solange, vous parlez de la question des biais que Lynn vient de, vient de soulever. Uh, Jusqu'ici, l'intelligence artificielle a, a, nous a montré plutôt de bons résultats, plus ou moins, pour des questions comme nous amener du point A au point B, ou comme de choisir le prochain chanson sur Pandora ou, ou uh, un autre système, ou, ou gagner des, des jeux de Go uh, contre des champions uh, sud-coréens. Uh, par contre, quand il s'agit de traiter de, ou de s'approcher des thèmes politiques et, et, et sociaux qui sont, qui sont très complexes, jusqu'ici, les exemples ne sont pas très, très bons. Il y a des, des, des chatbots de Twitter et Microsoft qui sont devenus racistes en l'espace de quelques heures après avoir été mis sur le réseau. Il y a YouTube et Facebook. Maintenant, on a une, une panoplie de recherches qui montrent qu'ils privilégient les, les contenus plutôt extrêmes ou les fake news, etc. Donc, euh, Comment, comment est-ce qu'on bouge dans le domaine des, des BLA Alors, il y, a, il y a plusieurs problèmes que vous évoquez. À mon sens, même celui de se déplacer d'un point A à un point B, si on, on fait complètement confiance au système, et si on n'exerce pas, nous, notre habilité à se déplacer tout seul sans système, je pense qu'on va perdre la fonction, même celle de savoir lire une carte ou même d'avoir envie de se perdre. Et le problème, peut-être, qu'il y a derrière tous ces systèmes d'intelligence artificielle, c'est de perdre le goût euh, du désir, puisque les algorithmes vont désirer avant nous, ils vont nous présenter, vont résoudre nos désirs avant même qu'on nous les ayons exprimés. Et je pense que là, ça modifie réellement notre nature humaine et ça va aussi peut-être nous contraindre à préférer des systèmes automatisés très performants à, à l'autre qui est, peut être 
qui peut être défaillant, vulnérable et qui ne sera pas forcément parfait comme un, un robot peut l'être. Donc je pense qu'il y a vraiment plusieurs niveaux euh, d'acceptation et d'influence qu'ont ces systèmes sur, sur nos comportements. Et moi, j'aime bien dans une ville pouvoir me perdre aussi. Bon, mais ça, c'est un autre euh, détail. Et... Euh Merci. Donc ça, c'est vraiment, il faut réfléchir à toutes ces conséquences-là et pas, je veux dire, penser en termes de performance, de rationalité. Et là, effectivement, on voit qu'on mesure, on attribue des chiffres. Et je pense que cette façon de coter les personnes, les, les quantifier, de leur donner une note, bon, on l'a effectivement à l'école, mais aussi on l'a en entreprise. Et ce qui me pose problème moi, en tant qu'humain, c'est cette quantification de toute chose, cette mesurabilité dans une optique de performance et de rationalité, notamment économique. Donc la prise en compte d'autres facteurs est très difficile. Pour en revenir à toutes ces euh, fausses informations, manipulations d'informations, ou ces robots qui vont effectivement générer des dialogues, vous donner à entendre ce que vous avez peut-être envie d'entendre, mais c'est la base de toutes les escroqueries, y compris sentimentales sur Internet ou dans la vraie vie. Donc c'est vraiment de la manipulation d'opinion pour conduire la personne à agir dans le sens qui sera bénéfique à celui qui la manipule. Et c'est des vrais problèmes qu'on commence, on semble les découvrir maintenant, de manipulation, euh, même de l'expression démocratique des, des, sites, enfin, des personnes, et euh, la manipulation aussi des dirigeants, qu'ils soient économiques, ou politique, et ça c'est un vrai problème. Et pour nous qui avons utilisé ces systèmes, on est toujours face à un espèce d'inconnu de savoir ce qu'on voit de l'écran ou de l'information et juste ouvrir, savoir si c'est la bonne plateforme sur laquelle on est connecté, etc. Et cette indécidibilité, non, le fait de ne pas pouvoir décider que ça soit vrai ou faux, juste, euh, intègre, euh, authentique, vrai, euh, va nous mettre dans des abîmes de perplexité. Et on aura tendance à croire le nombre, et on voit très bien que des tweets peuvent être tweets des milliers voire des millions de fois, et ce n'est pas le nombre qui fait raison. Et je pense qu'on va perdre la capacité de s'interroger de, de ce qui est dans la réalité de la vraie vie, enfin du, du physique et pas que du cyber ou du logique, euh, pour faire euh, cette comparaison d'informations, de pouvoir trouver euh, l'authentique. Lorna, je veux revenir à la question des droits de l'homme, parce que c'est une façon très facile de penser que nous devons essayer de trouver un moyen de infuser rights into machines, to, to use principles of human rights uh, to, to, to train and to uh, shape the machines. But I'm wondering whether the opposite is also true, whether the arrival of AI and similar technologies in our society are going to force us or push us towards a redefinition of rights, a redefinition of what's good and what's right and wrong, for example. In what, in what way are you thinking? Uh, I don't know, but suddenly, if algorithms start taking decisions for us, uh, then will those decisions over time kind of lead in a direction when somehow we start redefining what's right? Because, well, suddenly we find ourselves here rather than here, and you know, society changes without us really deciding it. Well. I, and I wonder whether that happens though with people as, as well when we're thinking about decision makers. And I think that that's what the, the framework that we have already, the human rights that we have already, that's what they're there for. They're, they're universally agreed upon principles um, that states have come together and agreed about and, and looked at how they apply in the world. And I think that that's what they're there for to ensure that certain harm doesn't occur. And I think that that's what's a bit worrying in this space, that when we don't go to international human rights, where, which are you know, universally agreed sets of harm, then we start getting locally designed, locally agreed upon values. And, and like Flynn's talking about, then that becomes dependent on who the designers are of the algorithms, who it is that's creating these codes in the first place, and then the decisions Will result from that very beginning point. So, you know, I feel, and, and in our research, we feel very strongly that we have clear definitions of harm that are internationally agreed upon, and we apply them to humans, human decision makers. So, why wouldn't they be applied to algorithms and to AI? Um, there can be a tendency that just because it's technology, we think that the frameworks that we already have are not fit for purpose. I think they are fit for. for, for Fit for purpose, but we have to take them into new spaces. So that does mean we're wor working with um, people who are designing code. Um, it does mean that we have to work with people that may not be as accustomed to working with international human rights, and we may not be as accustomed as working with them. So it's new dialogues and new applications, but not new rights. 
So you uh, co-directed this project called Human Rights, Big Data, and Technology. It involves a couple dozen researchers across many different fields, uh, including social science, not only computer science, anthropology, and, uh, and, and so. And one of the things you do is really to try to identify big risks and suggest ways of kind of regulating them. And now, when we think of, as you've seen also in the discussion, when we think of risks of technology, generally the first one we all think about is privacy, and the second one is privacy. Uh, and, 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 and we rarely move beyond that. Uh, so, so there isn't only privacy, no? No. Um, you know, as I said before, um, technology, data, AI, they affect all human rights. All human rights are at risk. Um, and they have very real, tangible outcomes. It can be that someone ends up being tortured you know, in prison. But I think we shouldn't discount privacy. Privacy um, you know, is a really key and important right, and it has a hu huge implications here because of the way in which technology works. And that can really have a big impact on how people self-identify, you know, how they operate and live in the world, their freedom of expression, what they're prepared to say, um, what they're prepared to say in their own homes, um, you know, because of the Internet of Things. So privacy is really key in and of itself, but it's also um, a gateway that once privacy is interfered with, all other rights um, are up for grabs, yeah. really, in a way that's much more profound than before when you had to get a judicial warrant to go into someone's house and search it. Um, you know, with so technologies that can, you know, listen in, in order to play music, for example, you know, we're seeing, um, we're seeing prosecutorial authorities trying to get that information and the recordings from that. Exactly. So um, thir 30 million Alexa devices are being sold in the United States, 30 million, which is one every 10 Americans, essentially. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what Alexa is, but it's a device for Amazon that you put on your table and listens to what is said in your house. And if one of the sentences starts with Alexa, it kind of turns on and listens to the command. Alexa, what's the weather like today in New York? And Alexa would answer in voice. But in order to be always on, to be able to answer that, uh, it needs to be listening environmentally to what is said in the house. And that figure mesmerizes me. 30 million devices in America only, which means that there are 30 million households that have a listening device alive 24 hours a day in their home. Does this surprise you at all? Any of you? Non, enfin, moi, ce que je voudrais poser comme question, c'est de savoir est-ce que le droit à la déconnexion peut être compris comme un droit fondamental, un droit humain fondamental. Ah, intéressant. <rire> parce que je crois, comme vous l'avez bien remarqué, effectivement, tous les droits humains sont mis à mal avec les technologies de l'information, quel que soit le niveau de maturité ou d'adoption de ces technologies. Et je pense qu'il y en aura un avant, les droits humains avant les technologies, puis un après. Et justement, dans cet après, est-ce qu'il ne faut pas reconsidérer même le fondement des droits humains et de considérer ce droit à la déconnexion Le droit de ne pas avoir un compte Facebook, Twitter, le droit de pouvoir se débrancher et sans être un criminel pour autant sans être catégorisé comme un criminel, parce que là, c'est ce, ce qui va être euh, effectivement oui. déduit. Do you catch the question? Uh, yeah. Should yeah. we add a right to be disconnected to human rights? Well, I think a, a connected point is that idea that it's the individual that should be carrying the burden here. You know, the individual shouldn't buy certain devices. Um, should, and also that the individual should really understand how they work and what R the implications are. Right now, are. Most, of, most of the burden is actually carried by individuals, right? In terms of flag uh, inappropriate content or make sure that your phone is off or this kind mm -hmm. of things. But I think that the, the question of what have you actually consented to and to what extent could you pick that up? What are the options in which you can turn off, turn on um, devices? The, you know, that's all really underdeveloped. And I think that people are still not even able to imagine what engaging with these um, devices might actually be able to do. Um, you know, the question, do they record, do they not record? I don't think that enters people's minds when they're buying these. They're thinking, this just sounds like a really convenient thing, way to order my groceries. And they don't imagine that the potential, that the data that comes from there can be um, taken together and combined with loads of other seemingly innocuous pieces of data to build a picture about you that is or isn't right, um, is or isn't accurate. And then the really crucial question, which I think connects with this um, idea of disconnect or what 
people, what control you have, is what can you do about it? And that came out in the film as well. You know, if a picture is built of you, one, how do you find out that that picture has been built about you? How do you know about which company sold your information or which company gave your information to state because they were legally required to? How do you find out where those pictures are and how do you challenge them? Like in the film, how do you get off a list if you're on a list? All of that really underexplored, but really crucial to people's lives. Yeah. Somebody the other day uh, in another panel said something like, uh, we need to imagine that that picture as a picture of us naked and a real picture of us naked, and that's what's out there. Uh, so we've used more than half an hour already, and uh, before we continue here, I would like to see whether anyone in the room has any question. We have microphones around, so we're gonna start with the lady here. Can we get some lights up so we can see the audience and figure out who is raising a hand? Yes, you, uh, here, please. Hello, um, and thanks for this really interesting discussion. I'm finding it even more interesting than the film. I have two questions, I think um, mostly for you, but perhaps some um, for the others as well. The first question, I think, more than the question of privacy, what I'm preoccupied with is the question of regulation. So may maybe my question is around regulation. Um, you said s something about needing to regulate earlier, and so my first question is simply, what would you regulate? You know, if you, if you, if you could you know, make recommendations to governments now on you know, three areas, you know, what would you regulate? Um, and related to that, my concern, I think, is um, regard, you know, the economy is the service economy, which is basically, well, to a large extent, data flowing around all over the place. And it seems to me, and the idea of human rights is, in a sense, or was originally protecting individuals from abuses of the states. And it seems to me that this, now the economy is so based on data that goes beyond you know, the capacity of any individual or, or entity to understand does, yeah, maybe that would be my question about has that fundamentally changed you know, what human rights can do and how human rights intervenes because you know, for good or for bad, the, this, you know, the scale of it and the complexity of it is so large, how does one even yeah, consider regulating it or, or, you know, for, for societal good? Um, fantastic question and one that preoccupies um, me and um, our team. Um, every day. Um, I think that there's, here in Geneva, there's a lot that can be done and is being done um, within UN agencies to look at what the response um, needs to be in the Human Rights Council being really important, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, other key agencies um, within the UN space. Um, so there's, there's big questions about the, how the human rights frameworks and other frameworks apply, but there's also um, sectoral approaches. So to take one example concretely, um, if we think about what we saw in the film, if we also think about how risk assessments are currently being used, um, using algorithms um, to decide whether or not someone should be granted bail, should be released from prison um, based on the likelihood that they may commit a crime again. And, and the same type of, of data being pooled in, some about the person particularly, and um, some general information, some of which there's a risk that it can be a proxy for race, for example, if we look at someone's neighborhood. Um, and a lot of the discussion right now is about, well, as long as there's a human in the loop that can intervene, um, and as long as that um, risk assessment is not um, the only reason that a bail decision is reached, then that's good. Um, my pushback on that would be, well, how, how well equipped and how effective is a human going to be and how ready is a human going to be to challenge a risk assessment that's produced by an algorithm that they don't understand. So I think right now if I could see one area where we're really looking at regulation it would be in the criminal justice space to say where can we be using these te types of technologies at all and when we think we can use them, what is the really strong oversight and safeguards in place so that we're not seeing human rights violations um, and human rights being at risk from things like discrimination. So that would be a really concrete sector area, but I think there's lots of sectors. And as your question also um, pointed to, um, the question of companies holding all this data, you know, I think that is a really important area where we need to 
to look at how human rights gets into that space and how it regulates the sharing of data between companies, um, between companies and states, um, and then between states and states, um, because the, that data can keep, can keep going and being processed by um, different technologies along the way. So, so it's a huge area because it impacts every part of life, but I think that we can start to, to break it down um, and, and have you know, effective um, interventions in particular areas. Uh, Flynn Solange, this question of the black boxes. I mean, machine learning systems, without getting technical, but machine learning systems essentially, uh, essentially use so-called neural networks, which are kind of layers upon layers upon layers of data treatment. And uh, in data go and out comes an assessment or a prediction. And even the designers at this point don't really understand how that happened and why that prediction gets there, because those layers kind of self teach themselves, self-learn, and therefore they change all the time. So how do we solve this issue of the black box? Because yes, human in the loop means somebody is overseeing, but if that somebody doesn't know what happens in the black box, then there is no way to oversee. Mais peut-être une façon d'aborder le problème, c'est de se poser la question euh, de, des droits humains dès la collecte des données. Et je pense que le, le problème majeur vient du fait que quand nous, nous sommes d'accord de donner une donnée sur un réseau social, sur un système de messagerie, ou, ou de taper une requête euh, Google, par exemple, euh, ce qu'on ne maîtrise pas, c'est les métadonnées qui sont collectées en même temps. Et je pense qu'on devrait trouver des dispositifs techniques que quand l'utilisateur se connecte ou utilise un service et soit capable, dans, les, dans son paramétrage du service, de dire que ma donnée a une durée de vie de 3 secondes, le temps que la requête soit traitée, doit être détruite. Je pense que techniquement, on arrive à le faire, à donner des caps d'invisibilité aux données que nous donnons, et puis surtout rendre attentif et éduquer les, les personnes, la population, au fait qu'il y a des métadonnées qui sont collectées. Et ce, ce que nous, nous donnons, c'est 20% de nos données. Ce qui est détruit, c'est 80%, c'est 80%. Donc c'est énorme, et c'est interdire peut-être des traitements algorithmiques de déduction d'inférence et puis la collecte des métadonnées. Bon, je pense que de, on devrait peut-être prendre le problème au, à la conception à l'origine ouais. à l'origine et ça ça va contribuer un peu à limiter euh, les données et puis là on a vu aussi dans le film des gens tout le temps connectés pour des services peut-être se poser nous-mêmes la question de l'utilité du service et est-ce qu'on est, qu est d'accord de payer avec nos données d'être sous perfusion numérique maintenu sous perfusion numérique en permanence et de se réapproprier nos besoins vitaux au regard des potentiels négatifs des technologies et des... C'est pas la technologie qui est mauvaise, c'est les fournisseurs, c'est les entités qui les, qui les produisent, qui vont voir leur intérêt immédiat, leur intérêt économique, puis toutes les entités criminelles qui vont trouver la façon de tirer parti, profit et puissance de ces données, de ces technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add to that, kind of the th one of the themes that's come out of what these incredible panelists have been saying is that, you know, the, especially with what's happening now is there's this concept of like, no, we're building this stuff, don't worry, we don't know quite how it works, no one really does, but we're cool, we're going to help you, so don't worry. And the idea is access at the very beginning is that we can all be part of this conversation. And I think that that's so much of what happens is that it stays siloed with a very specific demographic. And they say, we're building it, you, could, you don't really understand, you couldn't possibly understand. And we can all be a part of this conversation. We can all be a part of understanding. Just like, so we're the, we're, we're, the, um, we're the hero of our own story as opposed to just being an object. And we can all be part of this discussion, but there's very much a wall. Effectivement, moi, ce que je vois, c'est une grande asymétrie entre les utilisateurs qui, euh, qui donnent toutes leurs données et qui, euh, qui sont complètement transparents. Et en revanche, toutes ces entreprises qui traitent de ces données, qui n'ont pas de, de transparence, il n'y a pas de la transparence sur l'usage des données, sur cette vie cachée, ni sur les algorithmes utilisés. Et je pense que là, il y a la régulation va pouvoir peut-être donner des solutions pour imposer aux entreprises, que ce soit d'une start-up ou une multinationale, euh, d'afficher la façon dont les données sont traitées. Uh, D'accord. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Monsieur ici, puis monsieur là. Ouais. Merci, j'ai une question complètement naïve. Quelle est la situation en Europe le degré de conscience qu'on a de ces problèmes. Parce que, par exemple, je peux demander au génie qui est Solange euh, comment ils font face à de la stupidité, l'ignorance de beaucoup d'exécutants politiques fédéraux, alors qu'on a des génies comme elle, l'école polytechnique fédérale, la cybersécurité, intelligence artificielle, 
soit je pense que les politiques n'y comprennent rien, soit voir notre ministre de, de, de la Défense, c'est pas un génie. Euh, quel est l'état quel est de conscience, euh, la volonté d'interférer on a des très bons juristes aussi, on a des mathématiciens géniaux. Je ne comprends pas pourquoi la Suisse est aussi ridicule dans ce domaine. <rire> Solange, il y a trois questions là-dedans, que on va les prendre ouais. une par une. Est-ce que la Suisse est ridicule Est-ce qu'il y a d'abord un politique dans la salle qui pourrait peut-être répondre Non, mais moi, ce que j'observe, effectivement, c'est un degré de perception des problèmes différents, mais c'est surtout, je dirais, c'est les lobbies économiques qu'il y a derrière. Il y a des politiciens, et je serais plus tendre en, en, envers M. Parmelin que vous ne l'êtes, parce que je crois que c'est un des seuls conseillers fédéraux, fédéral, enfin un des conseillers, qui a bien compris la mesure du problème et qui, qui a une stratégie derrière. Mais ça, c'est un autre sujet, on ne va pas en parler. Mais ce que je crois, c'est le poids de l'économie suisse et de cette, cette, cette utopie de la croissance sans fin et de, de développement économique qui va passer par la numérisation à extrême, par l'ubérisation de la société. Et je pense que là, il y a une mauvaise euh, compréhension euh, du pouvoir de ces technologies et un laisser-faire, mais qui est global. Il faut pas... Euh... On voit les opportunités, on ne voit pas les impacts. Ça. Voilà, c'est ça. Et puis les opportunités, c'est un, une récompense immédiate, y compris pour nous, utilisateurs, quand on, on s'amuse avec notre gadget. C'est ouais. smart quelque chose. Hein, et on, on contribue à tout ça. Et je pense qu'il faut être un peu indulgent avec les politiques qui, peut-être, ont, ont eu du mal à percevoir la réalité du problème, puisque... Et même, moi, j'ai eu formé à d'écoles de magistrature un peu partout dans le monde, et je peux vous dire, les magistrats, il y a dix ans, le crime virtuel, ça n'existait pas, c'était virtuel, c'était dans le cyberespace. Il leur a fallu une certaine maturité pour comprendre la liaison avec la vraie vie et les conséquences. Et je pense que ce délai et ce retard pris dans la perception des impacts de cette euh, automatisation, robotisation de la société a été préjudiciable pour les garde-fous euh, nécessaires à, à protéger peut-être certaines valeurs qui nous sont chères. Mmh. Ça, juste hein, parce que monsieur a cité la situation européenne, euh, sans aller dans le détail, mais en, en deux mots, les, les, les généralités. Euh, D'ici deux mois, il y a une nouvelle euh, directive générale sur la production de données qui entre en, en vigueur euh, au niveau européen. Euh, la Suisse y est en tout cas partiellement associée, puis certainement pleinement associée. Euh, juste pour nous, utilisateurs, qu'est-ce que ça change euh, Ça met la responsabilité sur les entreprises euh, en termes de protection des données personnelles. Ça change beaucoup parce que c'est euh, un moyen d'imposer quand même une certaine régulation à ces géants de l'Internet qui sont malgré tout euh, très américains. Hein. Mais ce que je veux dire, en tant qu'Internet, on a le choix entre les Américains ou les Chinois. Alors peut-être qu'on préfère encore les Américains, mais ce que je veux dire, c'est leur faire prendre conscience que pour nous, en Europe, la, la notion de privacy, d'intimité numérique, qui est un des droits fondamentaux aussi au secret des correspondances, à la, à la capacité aussi de pouvoir se balader librement sur Internet, euh, est important et qu'ils doivent fournir des services qui permettent de protéger ces données. Et je pense que là où on, fait, euh, où on va les contraindre à se comporter autrement envers nous, c'est en, en leur faisant mal au portefeuille, là où ça fait mal. Et là, c'est 4% effectivement du chiffre d'affaires qui pourrait être éclairé en punition pour réparer ces problèmes. Le, en revanche, on voit bien que le, le, ce règlement général parle de chiffre d'affaires, mais quid des agences gouvernementales qui n'ont pas de chiffre d'affaires Tout à fait. Euh, on parlera peut-être de Chine si on, a, si on a un peu le temps après, mais je vois s'il y a d'autres questions d'abord. Alors, euh, monsieur, puis madame, puis on va vers monsieur là, derrière, et puis je vu une main ici, on va la prendre. Et puis donne-moi juste une seconde pour voir s'il y a quelqu'un en haut également. Euh, oui, d'accord. Alors, on commence par ici Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to raise the issue uh, of medicalization of uh, social science research uh, systems we have found in the uh, neoliberal society, mostly in that film. And I'd like to compare it uh, to the public health issue and the world situation in public health. And I do think that uh, uh, in health, and in ethical issues and in human rights issues, they come very, very closely. I would like to give you an example. Example, the last uh, UN General Assembly has changed totally the view of the world in public health. And WHO and the UN has decided that no more infectious diseases, infectious diseases, that, uh, and the comparison would be uh, somebody or bacteria do something possibly something bad, but that everybody has bad lifestyles. And what we use in public health is Gauss curves, and we never have a very good prediction for individuals, what they do. 
But if you, have a, if you are a diabetic, uh, a targeted person because you are genetic like this, well, you're likely to get it. But the likelihood remains a likeliness. Now, my question simply is that in this debate, seems to be the way you have discussed it is so far away from the public health uh, discussion uh, uh, platform on which this is discussed and from the world and the Western world is totally accepted and acceptable. And we have uh, very clear uh, uh, standards to be used. We know much more, I agree to this, and I do not want to compare the, uh, the medical authorities to the police authorities. But the so, question is, is uh, 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 yeah. what is the big difference to this? And I would like to have clarification. So let me, let me, let me, let me try to translate the question, because there is a, health, there is a dataization of healthcare, in a way. And health data seem to be probably one of the top three uh, uh, issues and targets of interest. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made if we can put this kind of technology into healthcare. Uh, the gentleman seems to, 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 to think that the practices that already exist probably need to be replicated into the system. But what's your assessment of that? Je voulais juste dire qu'il y a le sommet, le e-health summit in Genève, en Genève, à Genève le 10-12 avril prochain. Donc on va débattre de ces questions. Et la semaine prochaine, le 20 mars, il y a le, la santé numérique à Genève toute une journée qui débattra aussi de ces questions-là. Donc c'est des sujets qui, qui sont pris en compte, qui préoccupent la communauté, qui, qui sont peut-être traités dans d'autres forums que dans celui-ci. Mais le lien, il est, il est important. Flynn, in the, in, the, in the scope of healthcare, clearly it's a space where the debate we had before about huge opportunities versus huge risks come exactly into the center, right? Uh, Everybody is looking at AI to help you know, speed up research about things like cancer and others or monitor epidemics, as the gentleman was mm -hmm. saying. At the same time, uh, possibly some of the most precious data are the ones that have to do with our individual health. So how do we square that? I think that these are some of the greatest questions also because these are some of the advancements that are starting to happen right now in AI. And again, the same tool that can be used to help someone who has been ill or has an impairment can also help increase inequality depending on who has access to this tool. So I think that these are some of the most pressing questions because you know, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's never going to be going back in. So I think that these are some of the things that touch people the closest. And again, it could go either way. But the answer is that the technology is here. So how can we use it? And what I really like about what you're speaking about is this idea of public access and public health as opposed to a very real scenario of a very specific small set of people controlling all the data and using it for their good and, and increasing the inequality into who has access to these systems. So that it's, it's similar to advertising, they've always used behavioral science to get people to buy things. That's not going away, but because of that, if you get people in human rights or on other sides of the debate into it, then again, we can be in the fight. So I think these are really important questions because, again, health in terms of AI is really still very, very small group of startup companies in, t in Silicon Valley, for example. But we need to be thinking about public access, and it's a very complicated question. Just, you know, for example, um, to use AI in creativity. Some people say, well, it's taking away an artist's ability to make a painting if an AI can do it. Yes, that's the case. But on the other side of things, if we partner with these tools and work in collaboration with them, it can lift our creativity to new heights. It can kind of free humans to be more creative, and it can free, for example, a doctor to spend more time with an actual patient if they're getting some help sifting through the data. I've, I've heard that story many times, and, uh, and I agree on one level and I disagree on the other. And here is why. Uh, and, and, then, and then we bring him with a question of jobs because it's the big elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. People are very concerned about AI, robots, anything like that coming in and taking jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason why I, I, I have a part of me that agrees and part of me that disagrees is uh, if the technology frees up more time for, pay, for doctors to spend with patients, the question is who is going to pay the doctor to spend the time with the patients? Because if we had that money, we would spend it today. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so is it, it going to give more time to the doctor, or is it just going to diminish the number of doctors? Mm -hmm. 
Well, these are the questions. This is why things like regulation are, is so important. And I love what Lorna said, too, about this is touching every space. So it's not actually just about one big regulation. Actually, every sector is going to need to have answers to these questions. So again, either route is completely possible and any number of routes in between. So the answer keeps coming back to we need more people in the room that have ideas like public health or human rights on their mind. You know, when you're talking about ethics, there's so many discussions of ethics in AI, and I'm saying, where is the ethicist? I don't see an ethicist in the room. I don't see someone focused on public, public health in the room. So there's no one answer other than we need someone that's going to say, you know, I like that idea, but have you thought about this? Because we can't possibly all have the answers. Anyone that says, I alone can fix it, that's a red flag. Yeah. So we need to be able to have more people in the room to say, hey, but have you thought of this? But have you thought of this? Laura, this question of, of work and jobs, uh, there is this is a report from Oxford University three years ago that has become world legendary uh, about 47% of all professions being at risk because of AI. And then dozens of other reports somehow going in the same direction. And then there is a whole other school of thought that says, it's not the case because AI is just going to you know, take over the routine jobs, and therefore we're going to be left with the more creative jobs, which is a pretty cool situation to be. So where, where, where do, we, do you sit in that debate? Um, well, it's a complex one. Um, I think that, you know, on the one hand, we've always seen this debate when we have a technological revolution that there are going to be jobs lost and there's usually been the response that, well, these um, jobs will be replaced by technology, but this new technological revolution will create a new wave of jobs. I think what's different here, particularly with AI um, and the extent to which AI can become and, and assume certain human functions in the way that older technology didn't. Um, I think what's different is it's not absolutely clear that new um, ways of living will create new jobs. I think what's also different is that it, set, it's go it looks like it's going to affect all levels. Um, so it's not just um, certain types of jobs that are going to become automated. Um, and I think that what's good about that is it's woken people up to the question about this. Um, then there's the bigger debate about, well, what if large parts of the population don't have jobs anymore? Um, is that actually what we want? Do we really want um, you know, large people, even if there is some kind of um, payment to their yeah, so people universal can basic income. You know, so we had a debate and, yesterday night about and that. Yeah, just and so here we downstairs. come right back to what you know. What are the what's the point of how being human? And, and how do we want to live? And and just because we can do it, do we have to do it? And I think that your your question about the doctor is a really key one because um, it's not just about the economic value and and. Um, and efficiency of these technologies, but if we're going to employ them, then we have to have a clear debate about, well, are we employing them in order to give the doctor more time, for example, yeah. or in order to do something? That's within our control right now. That's within our gift. Yeah, for now it still is. But um, we sometimes just get um, carried away with, well, the technology can do it all, so therefore yeah. we just have to follow the technology. Actually, we're completely in control. And that's where, just to connect to another debate, I get really worried when people talk about, well, if the, if the technology does it, then who's responsible? Who's responsible? The people that decided to employ the technology. Humans are still there. <laughs> that's actually know? one of the big challenges, but uh, we open up a whole new field yeah. there. So let's go and take another question. There's a question here, uh, the lady, and then we go up there, and then we come down for more. Uh, bonsoir. Je voudrais d'abord remercier la professeure Garnauti parce que je, je trouve ça bien d'avoir un petit peu de scepticisme quand même. Euh, ça me fait plaisir d'en voir en tout cas. Euh, en tant que juriste, j'ai quand même deux, deux questions. Je, je suis d'accord qu'il y a des sujets euh, qu'il faut aborder, euh, sur lesquels il faut réfléchir et qu'il y a peut-être plein, plein, plein de, de, de domaines où l'intelligence artificielle pourra être utilisée, mais il y a quand même deux choses qui me préoccupent énormément euh, et qui sont là, qui sont présentes et qu'il faudrait aussi euh, qu'on qu gère. La première, c'est... On on juge des personnes qui n'ont pas encore commis de crime. C'est-à-dire que sur l'iter criminis, le chemin, le chemin de, de la criminalité, on, en fait, la personne n'a rien encore commis. C'est simplement un délit d'intention, en fait. 
ça, ça me pose personnellement un gros problème éthique, et c'est un, un, un gros débat en, en termes de droit pénal, mais je pense vraiment qu'il faut qu'on se pose la question euh, de est-ce qu'on peut punir quelqu'un qui n'a pas encore commis quelque chose, euh, qui a simplement peut-être l'intention, ou même pas l'intention de le faire, qui a juste pensé, qui n'a jamais pensé « qu'est-ce que j'aimerais tuer mon voisin quand il fait du bruit ?» Euh, voilà, c'est ce genre de choses qui me pose problème. Et puis la, la, la seconde chose, euh, c'est co-présenté par l'Académie de droit international humanitaire. Il y a un gros problème en droit international humanitaire, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, vous disiez qu'il y avait des drones euh, qui, qui livraient du sang, c'est super, il y a aussi des drones qui tuent. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on a, on a quand même des, 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 des armes autonomes, autonomous weapons, et, et, et ça, ça me, moi, ça me pose sérieusement un problème. Vous parliez de, de responsabilité, c'est exactement ça. Qui qui est derrière ça Quand est-ce qu'on va pouvoir avoir de la justice quand, quand il y a des crimes contre l'humanité À qui est-ce qu'on va dire « Ah, quand même, vous, vous avez une responsabilité là derrière ?» Alors, on va peut-être laisser la deuxième question au prochain débat, parce que c'est exactement <rire> sur ce thème, les robots tueurs, ici dans cette salle, dans, dans une heure. Oui. Euh, mais sur le oui. premier point, sur la oui. question de euh, l'intention de commettre un crime. Moi, je voudrais juste dire qu'avec ces technologies de, de surveillance de masse, c'est qu'on est tous coupables. On est par défaut tous coupables et on a un renversement de paradigme qui est énorme. Oui, et je dis exactement la même chose, c'est que c'est systématique. Et donc, c'est tellement important que nous sommes tous partie d'un problème ou d'une solution. Et que je pense que cette idée de ce que vous ne pouvez pas, vous ne pouvez pas être encore coupable, comment vous pouvez possible être entrée pour quelque chose et c'est parce que vous avez la data est pas techniquement neutre parce que quelqu'un a décidé. Donc, c'est construit dans la biaise, les biaises sont déjà construites, donc c'est la seule chose que nous pouvons faire, c'est comprendre que c'est là, que ce n'est pas juste que vous n'êtes pas coupable, 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 que So eventually, you know, it's starting to understand and learn on its own, and we don't understand where it's going, but it's built by us, so the only really sure thing we can do is say, wait, this is biased, we have to question it. It's an algorithm, so it's fine. You know, that's this idea that, well, the technology did it, so it must be sifting through the data. No, a human created that system. And I, and I love what you said, too, because this has to do with all types of things, from harassment to the future of technologies, that we're all part of the problem and the solution. And we can all do our part, and we all have a role to play. So I think that's really well said. Let's take a question from up there. Was somebody raising uh, their hand? Yes, please. Um, donc, j'avais une question, peut-être un peu uh, naïve, mais le principe même de l'intelligence artificielle, si j'ai bien compris, c'est uh, de créer une, bah, une forme d'intelligence qui est extérieure à l'être humain. Donc, ça veut dire avant que on ait atteint la singularité. Donc, la singularité, si j'ai bien compris, c'est quand on on atteint le, le niveau d'intelligence de l'humain, ou bien qu'on le dépasse, enfin voilà. Euh, Est-ce que finalement, le principe même de l'intelligence artificielle n'est pas dangereux, euh, puisque au bout d'un moment, bah, on n'est enfin, déjà plus vraiment en contrôle de, de tout ce qui se passe, et même si sûrement on peut, on peut coder euh, les, les systèmes euh, de la manière qui nous arrange au début, enfin je veux dire, comment on peut savoir que, vu que l'intelligence artificielle se se régénère elle-même finalement, qu'au final, on sera de toute manière plus en contrôle de ce qui va se passer. Is the sentence in the movie, why are we pushing this technology on ourselves? Why are we pushing this technology on ourselves? I think that that's such a great question because it goes to this idea of what it means to be human and to be moving forward and to, you know, to disrupt and to innovate and to create new things. I think that you know, one of the things that, one of the only things that sets apart humans from other species are, is our ability to cooperate in big numbers. And I think, I, I love kind of the door that you opened because you know, what I think about all the time is, well, you know, what does intelligence mean? And what does it mean to be conscious and to be alive? And I think that what can really help and what AI can really do is hold up a mirror to say, What are we so wrapped up in that we need to make sure that human intelligence is the only intelligence that matters? And um, what are we so afraid of with AI? And it's that we would no longer be at the top of the food chain. But the truth is that an octopus has a certain type of intelligence. All different, you know, nature has a certain different type of intelligence. And if we can open to do the door to that, we'll be a lot less afraid because we don't have to be special to matter. And I think it's really, really a great question because we can't solve these other questions if we haven't figured out what our own intelligence means. And I think that's why it's redefining these questions. And it's very scary in a way. Moi, je crois que le mot intelligence est effectivement très, très ambigu et très difficile à, à définir, mais je crois que pourquoi on le fait, c'est parce que je crois qu'on a juste peur de la mort, qu'on essaye de, refon, de repousser les frontières et euh, de se prendre peut-être un peu pour euh, le créateur de l'humanité. Et je pense qu'il y a des, des, 
des personnes qui, euh, qui sont dans ce courant de pensée de pouvoir dépa dépasser les limites du biologique en y intégrant de l'électronique et d'avoir cette vie éternelle à travers des systèmes, à travers du code informatique. Il y a un mot aussi qu'on n'a pas forcément trop développé, et c'est plutôt trois slogans, je dirais, de la Silicon Valley, c'est de transformer les données en argent, ils le font très bien, transformer la connectivité en pouvoir, ils le font aussi très bien, et puis transformer le code en loi, et changer de paradigme en pensant que le code a raison, et nous mettre en, en situation de, de dépendance, de soumission au code informatique, au système, ça veut dire au concepteur de ces systèmes. Et je crois qu'il faudrait s'intéresser un petit peu à la psychologie et à la motivation de ces, de ces concepteurs, et peut-être aussi de la part de rêve qu'ils offrent à des, des ingénieurs qui vont être challengés pour trouver des idées nouvelles. Et je pense que là aussi, il y a une grande utopie de la technologie ou de ce rêve, pas américain, mais si quand même, de la Silicon Valley, cette siliconisation du monde, et je pense qu'elle est porteuse d'espoir pour pallier nos faiblesses humaines. Et je pense que plusieurs d'entre nous y adhèrent complètement et c'est inscrit dans un contexte culturel, géopolitique bien particulier. Et il me semble que ces grands patrons d'entreprise ont, ont des envies de puissance démesurées. Cette question de, du code qui devient loi, code is law, ça fait dix ans qu'on discute de ça, c'est Larry Lessig qui l'a sauvé en, en premier euh, dans un article plutôt célèbre. La notion, c'est essentiellement que toutes les lignes de code définissent ce qu'on peut faire ou ce qu'on ne peut pas faire devant un ordinateur et donc dans le cyberespace et donc dans tout l'espace digital à, à, à venir. Et donc, c'est l'équivalent exactement d'une règle légale, en quelque, quelque, quelque façon, mais pas nécessairement décidée par des entités représentatives, voilà, simplement décidée par un groupe d'ingénieurs quelque par part un, une dans une entreprise. Une minorité de personnes qui ouais. sont très, euh, très genrées et très spécifiques. Et c'est le ce problème, c'est qu'il n'y a pas eu de débat euh, de société sur ces questions-là. Et c'est pour ça que euh, des séances comme celles de ce soir sont importantes. Alors, on revient ici en bas, il y a monsieur là et puis madame ici. Ouais. Gardez votre main levée comme ça, elle vous voit. Puis il y avait quelqu'un ici aussi, non Non, c'est bon. On revient ici après. Euh, bonjour. Le, le film pose très bien la question euh, du rapport à l'État par, par rapport à ces questions d'intelligence artificielle. Et euh, je voulais poser une question par rapport aux relations entre les individus et, et dans une même société que ça pose également. Euh, on a parlé à un moment donné de cet algorithme qui est devenu raciste après quelques minutes sur Facebook. Alors, il y a une certaine faillite de la machine. Hein. L'humain ne devient pas raciste en quelques minutes sur Facebook. Mais on sait qu'il y a euh, une certaine tendance à ce qu'on se, on se renferme. C'est-à-dire que l'algorithme le, le, nous donne ce qu'on a envie de voir, des choses que l'algorithme pense qu'on va aimer. Donc, il y a des suggestions qui sont faites qui au lieu que l'intelligence artificielle nous ouvre au monde, euh, c'est plutôt euh, un certain entre-soi qui est euh, favorisé par cette intelligence artificielle. Et, euh, et c'est peut-être pas un hasard que cet algorithme est devenu euh, raciste. Peut-être que euh, la faillite de la machine n'est pas tant une faillite que ça, mais une, une certaine tendance qui est favorisée par, par cette intelligence artificielle. Et du coup, ma question, c'est un petit peu, est-ce que... Euh, euh, par rapport à la question des droits humains, il n'y a pas quelque chose d'inhérent dans ces algorithmes qui va contre euh, un, un dialogue intersociétal, interindividuel, etc., qui irait au final contre les droits humains si on pousse un petit peu, euh, un petit peu la réflexion. Ce qui est la suggestion certainement du film. Uh, Lorna, maybe you want to take that? Yeah? Lord, uh, you... Sorry, Flynn, sorry. I think these are the really important questions, again, we need to ask, you know, as you as we, we all see every day, you know, when we go on Facebook, we start to see things that validate what we already know. So we have, we have fake news now. We have going on, you know, and saying, oh, we're getting this diverse amount of viewpoints, but it's actually just validating what we already know. And then this question of, you know, when we think about who we relate to each other as a society, and, you know, this question of human rights plus AI is a very complicated one, I think, because... <sighs> I guess, you know, what we need to start thinking about, in my opinion, is expanding this definition, because our current definition of machines are here, and news is here, and human rights are here, it's not really working for us anymore, and our current definition of human rights is difficult, because we, and it's not just AI, it's animals, it's the environment, it's how we treat each other, it's what we're seeing in the news, so I think that you bring up this important point, and my, you know, my answer to is we need to be redefining, actually, what it means to have human rights, what does it mean to be human, and who, who gets to be a part of that, and it's 
so t challenging because you also brought up this amazing point of, well, some things need to be fixed so that we can always have like a goal post, you know, that we can like an axis of values. But the truth is, is that we need to be redefining what it means to be human in our society. And if we're going to be like partnering with machines or if they're going to be part of things, well, what do we do? You know, who, whose fault is it when, when something goes wrong in a self-driving car? And like you said, it's the person that employed that technology. But then is the person that made it liable to that person? So it's coming up right against human rights, but there are answers to be found, I believe, but the answer is that we need someone who's tuned into human rights in that conversation. The person that created that Facebook algorithm is a computer scientist. So by default, that's just not the focus. And I think that there's, you know, innovation and disruption, there's a, um, there's a desire to move forward and then we'll figure out the ethics and the regulations later. And I think what all of us are saying in different ways is it starts from the beginning. We need to have these regulations in place. We need someone in the room that's having that discussion so that when we build these tools, they're not completely at odds. There was a question here. Oui, bonsoir. Moi, ma question est, euh, est la suivante. Donc, les technologies vont progresser de plus en plus rapidement, elles vont devenir de plus en plus intelligentes, probablement même plus intelligentes que les êtres humains, au bout d'un moment, ce qui fait que les êtres humains devront s'occuper autrement. La question que moi je me pose, c'est qu'est-ce qu'on fait, enfin, comment on occupe les êtres humains qui aujourd'hui n'ont pas les capacités cognitives de peut-être faire des études supérieures, comment est-ce qu'on va occuper ces gens-là qui, eux, font pour l'instant les travaux qu'on appelle nous répétitifs et qui sont quand même d'une façon ou d'une autre utile à notre société. Comment est-ce que les États vont occuper ces gens et faire en sorte que ces gens, euh, entre guillemets, dit de façon un peu méchante, restent tranquilles dans leur coin et ne se soulèvent pas au bout d'un moment parce que ils seront euh, frustrés de ne pas être occupés. Who wants to take that? <laughs> C'est une très bonne question. Moi, je dirais qu'on va les maintenir sous perfusion numérique, justement, pour qu'ils ne se... qu fassent pas la révolution. Non, mais ceci dit, c'est vrai que ça pose vraiment des, des problèmes. Tous déjà un peu sous perfusion numérique. Hein, donc... Oui, mais, euh, mais c'est des, des vraies questions d'accompagnement du changement. Parce qu'on voit cette course vers le changement technologique. Puis peut-être se leurre, cet espoir que nous mettons dans, dans ces innovations, appelons innovations ou rupture, quoi qu'il en soit, c'est effectivement des changements de paradigme. Et je crois que le leurre fondamental, c'est de penser que la technologie va résoudre nos problèmes fondamentaux d'être en vie, d'être humain et de résoudre des problèmes économiques, sociaux et politiques. Et cette fuite en avant pose vraiment problème, d'autant plus qu'on n'accompagne pas ces changements. Mais même nous, à l'université, on a du mal à former les gens, enfin nos étudiants, nos élèves à, à ces ruptures technologiques, à cette évolution. Et puis, si on parlait tout à l'heure de la médecine, comment va-t-on former les médecins Si on le forme juste à suivre un écran, peut-être qu'on peut réduire le nombre d'années des études. Et moi, ce qui m'interpelle, peut-être dans la même lignée, c'est de voir euh, par rapport au pilotage automatique des avions. Donc on, voit les, on a vu récemment les aviateurs être dépossédés du pilotage. Ils sont là pour accompagner ou pour surveiller l'algorithme, mais quand l'algorithme ou le système informatique tombe en panne, ils ne sont plus capables de prendre le contrôle parce qu'ils n'ont pas exercé euh, cet entraînement. Donc le médecin, comment va-t-on exercer sa compétence de médecin Comment euh, va-t-il va faire pour observer son médecin Mais regardez, si vous êtes allé à l'hôpital récemment, mais le médecin passe plus de temps à regarder votre écran qu'à vous regarder vous-même. Donc ça veut dire, quelle liberté il aura de prendre une décision contre celle de l'algorithme. Quelle sera sa responsabilité Et ça, je pense, c'est des questions fondamentales qu'on ne se pose pas assez. Et moi, je ne suis pas sûre qu'avec des algorithmes euh, partout en médecine, on diminue vraiment le nombre d'examens. Parce que, justement, les algorithmes, en prévisant dans toutes les bases de données, tous les logiciels, toutes les intelligences du monde, va trouver qu'il va falloir faire plein d'examens supplémentaires pour être sûr aussi. Et je ne suis pas sûre qu'on qu arrive à des, des réductions de coûts de médecine en automatisant tout, euh, tous ces actes, et, et, y compris dans tous les domaines. I was just going to add something that I thought about and that I saw in the film and that's related to this idea, which is that, so if in pre-crime, you know, the, the police are starting to use these algorithms to come up with a list, again, even if someone hasn't committed a crime yet based on their associates. And I'm thinking, I'm seeing these two young gentlemen that are being profiled, and I'm thinking, you know, for every time that technology is used 
but for that reason, we need to be using that technology to figure out how to be supporting the education, the vocational skills, you know, the employment so that people can choose another path. You know, it's so unfair that you're deciding someone's path without giving them an option to choose another way, and the very same tools can be used. So this is the idea, is that we're never gonna get rid of the authoritarian idea of this, and we're never gonna get rid of people exploiting it for profit. But there can be other people trained in this stuff that get in the game and say, hey, we're also gonna use it for other reasons. You know, here is, here is one of the difficulties of the situation now, is, is a purely economic challenge, which is, somebody calculated there are something like 120,000 people in the world, total, that can actually, that understand AI and can put their fingers on a keyboard and do something with it. That's not many. Now, 15,000 work at Google, 20,000 at Amazon, 50,000 15, at Facebook, the same numbers in the three big Chinese companies, there are about 17 left. So if, 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 a, if a government needs to go out and find somebody to run their AI thinking and understanding, they can't find that person. Universities now don't have enough professors to teach because Uber comes in and, and, and hires the 60 AI specialists from Carnegie Mellon, and suddenly Carnegie Mellon cannot teach anymore. So there is no next generation being trained. That's the big challenge we have now. Yes and no. I mean, I, and this debate has you know, kind of been in other sectors as well, as which, well, I would definitely get a woman to be on my panel, but I couldn't find any. They're there, you just couldn't find them. And, but it is true that it, it doesn't, it's not just about finding people, it has to start from that root level of training people, engaging people, and encouraging people. And it starts with saying, we can all be part of this conversation, and that we all matter, and that we all have a voice. And so that is the problem, and there are solutions, but they're very deep-rooted and, and complicated. But there are people that are training women in coding, you know, people of color focused on that. It is happening, and they are there. And that's the magic of technology. There is someone out there who's simpatico with your ideas and that who wants to learn, but they need to be encouraged. And we all have a voice and we need to be encouraged to use it and we need to pull out the chair for someone else at the table. Okay. A uh, couple more questions. One here, there was one there in the back. Okay, let's start with the lady up there. And then one, two, three. And then we will end the debate. Oui, bonsoir. Euh, je vais peut-être excéder mon rôle, mais ce n'est pas une question, c'est une réponse que je, vous... <coughs> que je voudrais donner. Une réponse pour mademoiselle ici <rire> Oui, <rire> ça m'a ça, ça été suggéré par les différentes euh, euh, interventions. Euh, L'intelligence artificielle et les big data, c'est donc une question d'argent et de pouvoir. Et si on veut pouvoir intervenir là-dessus, euh, je me demande s'il y a un autre euh, système que d'accepter le revenu inconditionnel de base tel qu'il a été discuté hier soir dans la grande salle. Ça va changer la vie, ça va changer le rapport au travail, ça va changer le rapport à l'argent et il euh, y aura peut-être aussi plus cette délégation de pouvoir à une minorité d'ingénieurs qui fabriquent le monde à notre place en ce moment. Voilà, je Madame, on ne va pas relancer le débat d'hier soir, mais je vais vous dire une chose. Il y, a, il y a une école de pensée qui dit en fait qu'il faudrait encourager au maximum l'adoption rapide de tous ces systèmes et créer un chômage généralisé. Tout le monde au chômage, mais tout le monde avec un revenu de base. Tout le monde. Euh, donc la valeur produite par le système économique euh, euh, robotisé, automatisé, qui est distribuée à tout le monde. Il y, a, il y a une sorte de petite école de pensée parmi les économistes qui pensent qu'il faudrait aller plutôt dans cette direction-là. On, on laisse le débat là pour l'instant, mais il y avait d'autres que, questions ici. Euh, monsieur, madame. Oui, oui, allez-y, allez on va prendre les deux. Merci. Uh, hi, my question would be, I think that there were a lot of great points that came from everyone. Um, if, as far as artificial intelligence, it is what it is. I mean, it's intelligent technology, but it still remains to be artificial, mm. which means that there's always humans that are behind this intelligence. Mm. So at the end of the day, um, there's always going to be a human behind it with a conscience, with their own values, with their own principles. So isn't it kind of idealistic to think that it will never be bias? Uh, this is a great question. And I think that um, I completely agree with you in that 
To be human is to be biased. There is no such thing as a blank slate. Let's say if you study this stuff your whole life, you're still born, and from the moment you're born, you're taking in information as, you know, from whatever demographic you're from, you're, you're learning as you go. So I think that the answer is absolutely there's no such thing as a blank slate. We all have our biases. The only thing we can do is be aware of them. We can be aware, for example, you know, we can be aware that eyewitness, eyewitness testimony across race is not accurate. Doesn't mean that if it's right in front of us, we're still not going to make the right choice, but we can say, wait a minute, we know that we have biases. And so you're exactly right. There is no blank slate. There is no technology without the human that made it, but we can say, okay, there's a bias here, so maybe we can have a diverse uh, group of people helping to check each other back and forth because no one person or company has the answer. There's a famous book published in Austria about 10 years ago, which relates uh, an expedition in the North Pole by three Austrian young men. And when they came back, uh, each, three, each one was interviewed about the experience. There is nothing more identical than going out to the North Pole with two other people. Everybody does exactly the same steps and lives exactly the same experience. But the three stories are completely diverse, completely different. Uh, the way the, recol the, the recollection was completely different, just to, to point out how bias are completely inherent. Yeah, and just to exactly what you said is a perfect example that um, there's so little we actually know about the brain we don't know exactly why we sleep. We don't know how memories work. So this idea of memory is what happens in a lot of mountaineering um, expeditions and just across life that, you know, memory is not fact. And so, again, just being aware of that can help us understand that just because I really believe it doesn't mean it's so. That's a really good example. Want to add something? Um, so I, th I think the point is exactly right, that humans are biased and humans are inputting data into these mm -hmm. systems um, so it can... It, it can often exacerbate or augment existing biases. What I would say is a lot of these examples that have come out in the last year, cu last couple of years, have really put this um, issue on the table. Um, you know, it's not something that people are not aware of about now. And I think what's happening now is a debate, one, about what design teams of algorithms look like. Um, so, um, as other people have been discussing, trying to diversify what that team looks like. And I think companies are starting to think we need more disciplines at the table and more experiences at the table. Um, I think what's also happening and needs to absolutely happen is that algorithms are tested at the very conceptualization stage um, before they even get out to market and tested and tested to see is there going to be any kind of bias, discrimination um, happening that we didn't intend to happen? Because obviously if we actually do intend for it to happen, that's automatically illegal. But um, is this algorithm um, going to produce unintended discrimination? And that's where impact assessments are really important and where the testing phase is really important. And so I think you know, that's where we need to move to, that, that before they get to market, they've really been tested and that there's strong oversight systems in place when they're running, when they're being deployed to test for um, these biases. Solange. Oui, c'est comme pour la mise sur le marché des médicaments, on les teste, on, il y a tout un tas de processus et de certifications qui sont nécessaires, mais malgré tout, il y a toujours des effets secondaires et la liste est parfois longue. Et là, en fait, on est, nous ne sommes pas arrivés à ce niveau de maturité, d'industrialisation de, de ces logiciels qui conditionnent notre vie. Et c'est un, un véritable problème. Après, par rapport au biais, moi, je dirais, il faut aussi l'attitude des personnes qui soient capables de faire l'effort suffisant pour se poser des questions de, par rapport à, aux informations qui sont manipulées. Et je pense qu'on est quand même... Plus la nature humaine, j'irais pour faire un, une généralité, est assez feignante. Et je ne suis pas sûre qu'on qu se pose forcément les questions, les bonnes questions au bon moment, surtout si on n'a pas été éduqué à se les poser, ces questions-là. Alors, on va prendre... On a, on a exactement 4 minutes, on va prendre les deux questions, mais questions rapides et réponses rapides. Monsieur d'abord, puis monsieur. First of all, thank you very much for what's been a very rich and thought-provoking discussion. My question is for Lorna. You said that you... Geneva has a role to play in this discussion. You'd suggested that the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner are already playing that role. It's hard to see. Um, but my question for you is, what is the role that you think the Geneva-based organizations, whether the political bodies like the Human Rights Council or the secretariat bodies like the Office of the High Commissioner or others like the ITU, what role do you see them playing? What contribution can they make to the discussion? Well, I, these are global issues. Um, 
first of all, the human rights impact is across all sectors, um, across all countries, um, and, it's, and it's happening in a global way um, with states, with companies, so there has to be some kind of international response. Um, so that's why I think Geneva is important. Geneva is the home of the human rights um, organs of the United Nations as well as other key agencies. So I think that for the human rights um, sector, it's about looking at how the international human rights law framework can be applied here um, and engaging um, with the space, looking at how these principles can be applied for this age um, through resolutions, through reports, um, looking at very concrete examples of how to ensure that states, that businesses are able to comply with their human rights obligations. Um, there is a framework there, um, and I think that it has to has to be in this space. Monsieur. I'll try to be brief. So we know, I think we all agree that the principal players of holding data is private companies, right? And I'm worrying a bit about regulation, so actually I believe that, and I hope you agree that regulation goes hand in hand with transparency. Now, how transparency is actually in line with the secrecy of corporate businesses? So yes, I don't know how you envisage to um, attack that uh, issue. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Lorna. Well, I think that there's, you know, there's a big debate about this right now, about the propriety interest um, and how this is actually dealt with. So I think there's there's a lot of debate about it wouldn't have to be the whole code um, that is revealed. Um, there's also discussions about what oversight bodies could look like um, that would be able to assess the impact um, on human rights while protecting. Um, the proprietary interests and the competitive interests of companies. So I think there's really a lot of work going on about how to achieve that because it is a, it's a key challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. And exactly what Lorna said, which is um, there is no one answer to that question other than right now it hasn't been a priority. So we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, which part of the code, again, some of the developers aren't understanding as much as the AIs about how things are built. But can it be a core part of what we understand to be important for us all to be a part of this discussion? And that, you know, one of the issues, again, is that the AI is being developed in very siloed, specific, separated places that haven't come to any type of understanding as to how much this is going to affect all of us. And so there, it's a very complicated question. One of the answers that we can start with is that needs to be a priority. Priority. And we need to understand that that is part of what we do, that we're not just trudging ahead and building things without understanding that that's important. Solange, le mot de la fin. Peut-être, en tous les cas, ça nécessite, c'est une priorité, je confirme, ça nécessite des, des débats et des échanges loyaux. Euh, et en fait, chacun défend ses intérêts. Et c'est peut-être euh, de replacer la, les notions de, de valeur plutôt que d'intérêt et d'avoir... Euh, cette authenticité dans les débats et cette volonté d'arriver ensemble à des solutions acceptables pour tous et qui nous permettent une vie meilleure et que le progrès technologique devienne un progrès social et un progrès, un progrès économique pour tous. Et je ne suis pas sûre qu'on en, en prenne la voie. Merci. On avait jusqu'à 8h. C'est 8h. Alors, merci Solange, Flynn, Lorna. Merci à vous.